Cooper, a bit of background. One of the things that I always find whenever I go to seminars is I want to know that the people that are giving me a talk have actually got experience in the field that they work in. I like to know that they're actually practicing what they preach. So there's the advert. It's a bit about Cone Cougar. We, yeah, we have won quite a lot of industry awards for investment expertise and so on. We've changed from being a general practitioner 35 years ago or so um, into an asset management company now. That's really what we do. Um, we are both chartered, certified and Securities Institute qualified. So we're about in the top 100 uh, firms in the UK with these multiples of qualification. But um, we'll come on to RDR in a minute and how that relates to this thing. And then we were the first um, investment advisor firm to receive a please commendation for services to Avon and Somerset Constabulary. And then we run the Money Manager uh, Observer Balanced Fund uh, for Money uh, Observer Magazine. And we've been doing that for the last four years. So we do a number of things, but essentially what we are is investment advisors. But I'm not here to talk about Coke Cougar, I'm here to talk about this. Accountants and the Retail Distribution Review. How many of you are familiar with the Retail Distribution Review? Can I have a show of hands? Well, good, because then this is quite a useful subject. It affects you under um, Part B, Section 241 of your code. Okay? It doesn't affect you massively, but hopefully you leave here in less than about 12 minutes with a lot more knowledge about the Retail Distribution Review, how it affects your practice, and how it affects your clients. So that's what we're going to look at very briefly. I want to also show you why it's potentially misleading. What are some of the issues that affect you as an investor, affect your clients if they turn to you and ask you for advice in any context to do with their financial affairs, and also some of the pitfalls, problems and failings of the retail distribution we do. I can tell you from my point of view as a practitioner, anybody in financial services that you know, it has been the biggest thing since the invention of the ARC. It really was a real turning point as an industry issue because we've had a change of regulator, as you know. We've had a number of regulators over the decades anyway. Um, but the RDR, Retail Distribution Review, was meant to be the most significant piece of legislative change for the retail financial services sector. So, for you to get, it's good to see no show of hands about um, knowing about RTR, because I think what we have to do <coughs> is make sure that I give you a quick overview of what it is and how it affects you and your clients and then these other issues. I promise you no mumbo jumbo, no jargon and no bull. So we'll have some very direct talking. I'm going to cover the slides in about 10 minutes or less and then that will give you an opportunity to get to the bar quicker. That will be my view. But if you want to ask questions, the boss over there has said you've got to make it last a bit longer. Okay. <laughs> so feel free to ask questions. Okay, retail distribution review and its aims. This one was really designed to do introduce a thing called advisor charging. And this affects you. If you're buying investments now, people giving you advice should actually charge you a fee. There is no more commission. That's what the RDR, this was a cornerstone of what its purpose was. Secondly, improved professionalism. Qualifications now are at degree level before they were all over the place. And lots of different examining bodies. Thirdly, advisor status. The regulator considered that there were too many different types of advisor, tied advisor and so on, uh, independent advisor. There were just too many different categories. So these were the core objectives of the Retail Distribution Review. Fairly simple and straightforward. You would think they could make a muck-up of it, wouldn't you? <laughs> I dare say, from those sniggers, we all know what's coming next. Okay, so, did they succeed? Let's have a look and see whether they succeeded or not. Advisor charging, they get across. I want to show you why, okay? Commission is still available. The whole point of the Retail Distribution Review was to abolish commission. But commission is still available. And it's still available because the big corporates in the world, as usual, manage to manoeuvre things, manipulate things to such a degree that they carved out certain product areas like life assurance, critical illness, mortgages, term assurance, all sorts of other advice that really should come under advice and advisor charging and said, you can still receive permission. John? I, I, I've just uh, uh, recently gone through um, an advisor that charged a fee. Yeah. I noticed, and it was disclosed, that he, he gets some shares in... Pension company that 
<laughs> I, I know that, John, I've said, don't ask any difficult questions. Right, <laughs> so here we are, post Google, post RDI. No change, absolutely no change. But we are technically restricted, even though we do all that. And it's whole of market. Because technically, that's how these rules have been worked out, because we use a platform, okay? If you're talking about the platform, I can explain the, the nucleus thing. So there's no change for us. Um, if you look at things like this balance manage fund that we run for Money Observer, just look at the list of companies down here. Okay, you can see these are the these are, the, are it's an actual example of the fund that we run and have run for the last four years. At the heart of it, all of those different types of investments with different companies are exactly what clients can expect. But if they thought that was independent, it's not. It's called restricted. And so the boundaries between understanding what the difference is between <coughs> one advisor and another, their status have become blurred again. The regulators made effectively a pig's ear of it because 3i Group, <coughs> iShares, uh, J.O. Hambro, Jupiter, all of these different companies are complete whole of market. How does it compare? I did this one just for you lot, really, because accountants always talk about investing in property, don't they? So I thought this would make a good slide just for a bit of, bit, bit of a dig, really. No, it's not, it's not, but it's just... It just shows you that people have a lot of faith in the housing market, they don't have so much faith in the, in the equity market, and yet clearly um, there are very, very different um, performance. Right, as I said at the outset, what was the point of all this conversation? Section 241 of the code expects you to know, when you're referring a client, whether the advisor you're referring to is independent or restricted. That's at the heart of what we've just gone through. That's what your obligation is. If you choose to refer someone to an independent firm, you don't have to do any more due diligence. It gets you right off the hook. If, on the other hand, you refer to a restricted firm, even if it's an asset manager like us, you're meant to do some due diligence. I'll let you read the code for the due, due diligence aspect. But in essence, what I talked about there is that that due diligence is not so easy because different firms can use different methods of referring to whole of market. In reality, I don't think the obligation is so onerous on you other than that you check with the status of the advisor. That's my gut instinct. Okay? Why is it important? Because clients turn to you for an impartial view. And I think when they turn to you and it, you know, look to um, your knowledge and skill, it's because they see you as the person that they trust to pass them on to a firm that you think is appropriate for their affairs if you're not doing it yourself in-house. Restricted isn't restricted, and not all restricted firms are the same. The only reason I'm showing you this is because even where we said in the, in the presentation, something like 80% of the largest type of investment advisor firms are now restricted, not independent. Um, within those restrictions, there are all sorts of differences. There are differences in their charges, there are differences in how they select funds, and how they give their advice. So you can't even rely on the simplified status of restricted being restricted. It really doesn't mean what it says on the tin. Confusing advisor status, confusing fee structure, and confusing commission. Um, the fact that commission is still available to all tied agents, all direct marketing firms, all products, life assurance, income protection, basic stakeholder pension schemes, to me suggests the regulators have made a real cock up. Because how is a consumer, or how are you, meant to remember the differences? Confusion is bad for consumers. It takes away the confidence for consumers to invest, in my view. Competition has been significantly weakened by the retail distribution review. And finally, there's less choice, less value for investors, because they don't shop around. They don't know how to shop around, they don't know who to trust, how, where to go. So at the heart of all of these changes, they were very significant. I have to admit, when I started, I was really surprised that so many of you weren't, if you like, particularly involved in retail distribution review or how it might impact your businesses or you personally. Because for us, it's been monumental as an industry. It's really made us jump through lots of hoops, lots of bureaucracy to satisfy these new rules, to explain themselves. The irony is, of course, that in charging fees rather than commission, the whole emphasis was meant to be that consumers would benefit from impartial advice. The fact that the industry, especially the larger players, has 
managed to carve out for themselves all these areas that I've mentioned where commission is still payable and therefore bias is obviously product driven, I think is more than unfortunate. The good news is, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for listening.